rock in whom we stand, Lord, who is our constant. And Lord, as we come to your word and listen to your voice, may you bless us through the reading of it and through the explaining of it. Lord, speak through your servant. And Lord, may we all hear your message for us today and give, would you give us the grace to live it out to the world. Lord, thank you for this time in Christ, my pray. Amen. Amen. You all may be seated. Good morning. Just for the record, my name is Kevin. I'm not Mel, even though we have the same shirt on. Not a baby uniform. I showed up to church. I walked in, and he had the same shirt as me, or I had the same shirt as him. Great minds shop alike, I guess. Um, if you have your Bible, turn to Judges 14. We're back in the book of Judges. It's interesting. There was a certain number of weeks I set aside to preach on the book of Judges, and yet it's stretching out much longer because of uh, everything that's going on in the world and the transitions of our church um, to video and back here. It's been broken up a lot. I was going to preach on two chapters today. I've narrowed it down to just one because we only have 20 minutes to do the message. Now, because we're back in the book of Judges, let me just give you a quick reminder of the setting. In chapter 14, I'm going to read this in bits and pieces as we go through it. I titled this, Enormous or Great Strength and Great Weakness in One Person. I think that what we're going to see in Samson is the very thing we see in his church today. There is great strength and yet great weakness. And the backdrop for Samson is very similar to our backdrop today. That's why the book of Judges has so much application to us. So because it's been a few weeks, let me remind you that this is the period before the kings. There are no kings uh, over Israel. And God is using a, a, a person called a judge. There are many judges. This book is the account of all of them. It's a period of about 300 years. And there's a cycle where God's people uh, fall away into the culture, they act like the culture, they begin to adopt the religions of foreign uh, nations, they serve other gods, they do the practices, some of them are very evil. God will raise up a nation to um, deal with that problem by causing stress, uh, enslaving Israel, robbing them to the point where God's people cry out to him, and so he raises a judge up who delivers them. Nearly every judge is a military leader. Now, in Samson, we have someone who's different. He's not a military leader. He's a warrior. And he's the only judge who, when he goes against the enemy, which is the Philistines, he does it alone. All the other judges, the, the people come up with, him, with the judge and fight against the enemy together as the people of God. But Samson marks a moment in God's people where they have begun to fall away to such an extent that they're content. They're content with being enslaved. They're content with becoming like the world. And that's one of the reasons that Samson uh, fights alone. Now, the, the Jews were accepting of the situation. The Philistines had amalgamated them into their, their people through marriage and through controlling certain trades, which I talked about weeks ago. But uh, I, I want to add this. At this time uh, of the story, they can't turn to the tabernacle. They can't turn to, to, to the equivalent of like the church, to, to God's religious leader. The, the um, priest at the time is Eli, and he has two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. If you know anything about them, they're terrible. Two sons of God's priest are abusing the system. They steal meat that is supposed to be for sacrifice and use it for their own purposes. But they also enacted uh, um, a Philistine perverse practice of tabernacle prostitution. So they don't get any religious leadership at all from who God has in place as well. In fact, in 1 Samuel 3, 1 of this time, it says that the word from the Lord was rare in those days. Now, 
To add to that, I want to just tell you that the parents, though, of Samson were good. God has a plan. And so he comes to them. I don't, you probably don't recall because it's been like three weeks ago. But the, the parents, there was a sermon I gave. And you remember that Samson's mother, it doesn't give us her name. She's like anonymous and barren. And that was part of the point that God comes and takes an anonymous, barren woman and says, through her, I'm going to give this man, Samson, who will deliver. Actually, he says, begin to deliver. Begin. He won't complete the delivery, deliverance, but he will begin to deliver his people. And I just thought I would read a quote, because in that sermon, I talked about how actually uh, his father, Manoah, was a little bit dim-witted, if you remember that sermon, because he was slow to catch what was going on. But Josephus is a noted historian. He wrote, that there was one Manoah, a person of such great virtue, that he had few men his equals, and without uh, dispute, the the principal person of his country. He had a wife celebrated for her beauty and excelling uh, her contemporaries. That says something about the stock of Samson's parents. Good stock. A man of virtue. Now, what is God going to do? He's going to take Samson and begin to use him in a way to bring deliverance because the Philistines were oppressing his people. I want you to turn to chapter 14. I'm going to just read this in sections. And we're going to start with the first few verses of chapter 14. It says, Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. Then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. But his father and mother said to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people that you must go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. Now, you have to understand that that's the way it worked in those days, that you went to your parents and your parents made the marriage happen. They went and worked it out with the other family and they made the marriage happen that way. So Samson is following the custom. He's going, he's saying, I found a woman, go get her for me, right? Now, as parents, we all want our children to grow up, marry a good person. We just had a wedding yesterday, right out here, uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, Kit, uh, your son got married right out here. Marriage is part of culture and life, right? The institution of marriage. But notice the pause in this passage. Manoah's father is troubled. He says, well, wait a minute. Is there not a woman, of our, she says, of all of our relatives or of our own country, our own people? He doesn't want his son to go and marry a Philistine woman. That's exactly what was part of the problem of the culture, is that the Philistines had intermarried into God's people and brought into all of those families of God's people their own Philistine gods and their own practices that were perverse and anti, uh, antithetical to their faith. And see, he's worried about that. You can see that. Good stock as parents, and yet they've raised their son, knowing he's going to be special, and yet he goes out into life, and they're already worried about him because he's adopting the values of the world. He's adopting a culture, not one of faith. And so the first thing I said, let's look at the quality of Samson. So remember the title, Great Strength. We know a lot about his strength, slaying thousands, ripping gates off of walls, but he's weak. The quality of Samson, the Samson is weak because of lust. The thing that, if you don't notice it, he, twice he, he, he mentions, she is right in my eyes. Now, Samson with the long hair. The chiseled body, that's how we envision him, the Fabio of the Israelites. I don't know. Yeah. And I always, sometimes when I say that, there's always like a young person who goes, who's Fabio? Right? But we're even old people maybe. But the, the thing is, sometimes, because remember what Josephus wrote about his wife? She's beautiful. She was known for her beauty. And maybe there's a curse there when you are this attractive person that you have to deal with this problem more. You know, somebody who, who uh, is not attractive may not, may not have as much temptation to this in the sense of uh, people coming and 
wanting to connect to you because of that. But we see here that Samson had a problem with lust. All through his life, we're going to see this. This is just the beginning of that. The thing he says about her, because he doesn't even know her. He's traveling. He sees her. Hey, there's this woman. She looks good to my eyes. And go get her for me. And this is how we, we begin with him. Um, you know, I... You know, this, I'm going to be self-deprecating here because I didn't have this problem. That's why I maybe set this up. You know, I was talking to, who was I talking to? I think it was Josh Madrid. And we were talking about uh, chess. He likes to play chess. And I told him, you know, the only trophy I ever had in my life was a chess trophy. I won it as a freshman in a tournament at our school. There were 50, about 50 boys out of the school. I beat a senior in the final. And it was the end of the year. They had the awards assembly. And I had my first girlfriend ever at the time. And I remember in that award assembly, I had to go up there and I got the chess trophy amongst all the other sports awards. The next week, she broke up with me. I don't know if the, I, I'm, I'm suspicious of, the, of that connection. Samson had trouble with women. And I lay that out at the beginning. You're going to see that he's weak because of his lust. Um, and his, there's a sense you get in there that his parents are heartbroken. Because they see his choice is not one of wisdom. His choice is based on the external, not, not what's in here. doesn't even know her heart. And let me show you the, the next thing, the quality of Samson. He's weak because of lust, but he's weak because he rejects authority. He rejects authority. The father says to him, can't you find someone else uh, from our own culture, from your own people? And he says to her, get her for me in verse uh, 3. For she is right in my eyes. Now, in studying this, let me just lay it out how the Hebrew says it. Uh, Take her for me, for she is right, pleasing in my eyes. That's a, that's a little more detailed in how he felt about her. It all had to do with her looks. She is hot, and I want her. Go get her, Dad. And for all of the uh, virtue of what is said about Manoah, they capitulate. They allow their son to fall into culture. And I, I wrote down here, there are two reasons that he should not marry her. And the first one is because intermarriage was forbidden. God's people were not supposed to intermarry with the foreigners because of all the reasons I've stated. But secondly, he shouldn't have married her because the parents didn't wish for it. The parents were saying to him, don't marry this woman. That's the way in which their first approach is to him. Son, go find someone else. And I thought about what a mirror that is of even our, of our own culture. Do we look for women or even husbands, right, uh, here? What is on the inside? Or are we just looking at what is on the outside? And when a father gives advice, do we heed it? Do we take advice of our parents? Or do we trust in our own wisdom or our own sight in this case? Because that's the backdrop of Judges. At the very end, you want to know where we're going in Judges. When you get to the end of Judges, what does it say? The last verse, there's no king in Israel, no king in the land. And then what's the description of God's people? They did what was ever right in their own eyes. And we see that in Samson. He is like the culture. I'm going to do what's right in my own eyes. And you know what's right in my eyes? She's hot and I want her. Instead of, I should listen to the counsel of my father. Or I should follow what God says, that we don't intermarry. Instead, I'm going to do what's right in my own eyes. Sometimes when I interact with my children, I have to remind them. Because our culture even today presses upon them the wisdom of of what's right in our own eyes, what is truth. And I take them and I say, you know what God's word says? Look at, what, look at Solomon in all his interactions with his son. What does he say over and over again? My son, listen to me. My son, heed my words. My son, my son, my son. You get a picture of a father pouring himself into his son, the wisdom of his life. In fact, in him, the, the wisest man perhaps who ever lived on the planet Earth. And he's having to appeal to his son. Please listen to me. My son, listen to me. My son, 
Don't be enticed to run with sinners. My son, don't, don't listen to the sweet lips of a prostitute over and over again. Should a father or even a mother have to plead that much when God's word says, children, respect and honor your parents. And that's just one level of authority. God the Father is authority. Religious leaders have a sphere of authority. Civil leaders have a sphere of authority. And there's a bottom line issue with Scripture that he says, respect authority. And what we see in Samson, he rejects it. And in actuality, it is a weakness of him. Not a strength. To trust in his own judgment. Samson is weak because he rejects authority. <clears throat> in this way, one writer says, Samson was a self-confessed spiritual anarchist. He rejects both God and his parents, and he looks more like the culture than he does God's servant. The great battleground of our time is the battleground for authority. As we can see right in our modern news. The great battleground today is a battleground for authority. And I would say to God's people, don't be like Samson. Don't be like the culture that, that is wise in their own eyes. But trust in how God has laid it out. The areas and spheres of authority are there for a reason. And to the young generation, I say, you learn it first at home. By respecting the authority God has there. Number three, as we look at the qualities of Samson, he was weak because he lacked self-discipline. Verses 8 and 9. After some days he returned to take her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. I, I skipped a few verses there. On his way to Timnah, it says that a lion came out uh, to kill him, and the Spirit of the Lord filled him. And he. this just shows you the 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 immense strength that he had. He kills a lion with his bare hands. But the carcass lays there over time. And in the dead carcass, bees form a hive. And there's honey in there. Now it says here that after some days he returned to take her. And he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees in the body of the lion and honey. And he scraped it out into his hands and went on eating as he went. Now, you might think, well, what's the big deal about that? But in my Bible, I underlined the word scraped. Because when he did that, when he went to that dead carcass and touched it and reached in there for that sweet honey, he broke one of his vows. God set aside, I know it was three weeks ago when we talked about the, the lesson about his parents and setting Samson aside. He was going to be a Nazarite. And, and there were certain things he was not allowed to do as part of his role as a Nazarite. And one of those was you don't touch dead bodies. And don't have time to explain all that, but he breaks it. In other words, this is another sign where he, he breaks it. He, 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 and it. It's right in my eyes. I want that, honey. I'm going to get it. But the reason I put here self-discipline is there. I want to show you in this, in this little moment, he, he decides I'm going to break this vow, but I haven't broke the vow of cutting my hair. And there's this this. Look at that uh, contrast. He is choosing which vows he wants to follow and which vows he wants to break. And the one he wants to break, he breaks it because he wants something. And that vow stands in the way. That as well is a picture of today. God's church, Christians, old generation or young generation, struggle with the very same thing. God's word tells me two different things. And on this one, I say, I'm going to follow. But over here, I'm not going to follow it because there's something that I want. There's something sweet, some honey. And I'm not going to follow what God's word says because I want that. And we pick and we choose. And in that sense, we are weak with self-discipline. We lack the same self-discipline that Samson lacked. Now, this is bad because... Samson totally misses the reason the vows are there. He looks at them as a, as a code of separation and totally overlooks the concept of holiness. 
the same thing we can do. And I heard one uh, writer use the illustration of a castle where you come and you fortify that front gate so the invader, so the threat cannot get into the castle and you do nothing over here about the back gate. And when the enemy comes, he comes right in the back gate because you haven't fortified that. That is like a, a undisciplined, spiritually undisciplined person. Because you say, I'm going to pick this one. I'm going to fortify. I am not going to sin against God. This is my vow. And you totally leave the back gate open so that when the enemy comes, he can get in there and invade and bring us down. Self-discipline is needed. I was reading one, uh, one of my, an author that I like. His name is Mark Sayers, and he wrote a book called The Disappearing Church. It's about today, about how the presence of the church within culture is disappearing, largely because of the community of God's people themselves. And, and he talks about this very thing, about this picking and choosing. And he says, instead of throwing ourselves into a crazed life of sexual abandon with a string of partners, dad sneaks a look at porn on his phone in the den while upstairs his wife loses herself in 50 shades of gray on her Kindle before they both make it an early night to get kids to football training in the morning. A young man, after taking ecstasy two nights before, orders a breakfast consisting of kale and ginger health shake because he is still prepping for the mini marathon at the end of the month. That you see within God's people particular disciplines for the things they're interested in, but they abandon other areas of discipline because of lust and their desire. And in reality, the presence of God's people are weak in culture. And lastly, I put here, well, I'm going to talk about, show me the next slide, the providence of God. But before we get there, because that's actually the end, I've got to give you the in-between real quick. Because it's a 20-minute sermon, I'm going to summarize this chapter. Because what happens is he shows up uh, to uh, his wedding. His father puts it together. They're going to get married. And when he shows up, um, there's a drunken party. And it says 30 guys come as part of the party. And then Samson challenges them, says, I'm going to give you a riddle. If you can solve the riddle, you each have to give me an article of clothing but if you can't get it, I'll give each one of you an article of clothing. So it's like a wager, right? And they take him up on it. He says, I'll give you seven days to solve it. Here's the riddle. It's in verse 14. Out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. Now we know what it is because we can see the whole story. It's the lion, the lion that he killed. Out of the eater, that's the lion, came something to eat. That's the honey. Out of the strong, that's the lion, came something sweet, right? We know the answer, but they don't. And it says, for all these days, they couldn't figure it out, and they were stressed out. And so their strategy was to go to the woman he's supposed to marry and threaten her. They go to her. They say, look, did you bring us to this wedding to rob us? We, we're in this situation now where we're going to have to owe this guy all these clothes. And this is what they say to her. You find out what the answer is, or we're going to burn you and your father. And so she begins to put on her charm, and she goes to him, which is another weakness we're going to see in Samson. He gives in to the women in their charming ways and their uh, relentless um, asking him. Uh, and she ends, he ends up giving, giving it away. So then when the day comes where it's, it's time to give the answer, they know the answer, and it angers Samson. And the story says that he goes away and he slays uh, 30 men and takes their clothes. Actually, I'll take it to you. Verse 19, it says, And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon and struck down 30 men of the town and took their spoil and gave the garments to those who had told the riddle. In hot anger, he went back to his father's house. Now I'm going to stop right there. But here's what I want you to see. Whoa, you got ahead of me there. Just leave it up there, though. Okay. The providence of God. I just gave you all, that, all the, the story of what happened so I can give you these two points. Despite all of the weaknesses of Samson, you're going to see that God is a king on his throne who is providential. Providence meaning he's in control. And I put up here, God is able to work his plan for his own purposes. 
Do you know what the back, the, the, there's an interesting verse I skipped over. I want to take you back to it. Verse 4. Listen to this verse. His father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord, for he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines at that time the Philistines ruled over Israel. The big picture is the Philistines are oppressing my people. They're enslaving them. And God's going to use Samson as a deliverer. And so look at the story. Samson, in his weakness and his, his immaturity, his sinfulness, she's hot, I want her. The parents, oh, did we raise him right? He's choosing the wrong one. I'm going to capitulate anyway. And the backdrop to it all, to the stressing over that, to the worry, to you looking at Samson going, what a, what a stupid guy. There's this verse that says God is behind it. He, God is never, this is great, in the New Testament, he can never cause anyone to sin. He doesn't tempt people in that way. But it does say he's a God who weaves stories together in such a way to bring about his purposes. So Samson, of his own free will, out of lust, sees a woman and starts this whole thing. But behind it all, God's going to make something happen to bring about deliverance in the end. He takes bad things that happen and brings about something good. You should, you should let that sear into your mind as we watch what happens in our world today. He takes bad things that are happening and brings about good. The story of Joseph, his brothers throw him into a pit, sell him into slavery, and later in life when they're, they're together, they're, they're, they're weeping at what they had done, and Joseph says, oh no, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. He can take the most evil of intentions and weave about goodness out of it and not be implicated or tied to the evil choices himself. That is a providential king who knows how to weave things together. God is able to work his plan for his own purposes. And God is able to deliver his people. In verse 19, which I read, it says, The, the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon and struck down 30 men. It's the beginning. The beginning of, of war where Samson will deliver God's people from the oppressors. This is the, the catalytic moment for that. And I just finish with this. Because for us today, Paul writes in Romans, right? He's able to work together all things for good for those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Let that sear in your mind. Who are you most like in the story? If you are a, a Samson type where there can be great strength in you to be used by him, yet there's a lot of weakness in you and a lot of failure and you've lusted and, and, and chosen paths that are not godly and you lack self-discipline and you look like Samson. Actually, you look like the culture today. You're being sucked into to, uh, whatever the movement of the world is and you're not set apart as God's servant in some way. I want to remind you that whatever choices you have made, God can make all things work together for good for his purposes, not your own. And I want to tell you, it says here, the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. Samson's over there. He's, he's in the moment. The lion is coming upon him. He has to fight 30 men. The spirit of the Lord's here and the spirit of the Lord rushes upon him, fills him. And what does the Spirit do for him? It gives him the supernatural strength to kill a lion, to slay 30 men, and to do more, as we'll see in his life. And my point to you is to say, how much better you have it. Because the Spirit of the Lord is not over here with you. If you're a child of God, the Spirit of the Lord dwells within you. He is already in you. And Paul says that the power of the Spirit of the Lord grows within you when you walk by the Spirit. Don't walk by the flesh. The example he gives is don't be drunk with wine. When you're drunk with wine, the, the drink is controlling you. The drink has affected your judgment. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he goes on to say, reading Psalms and, and songs, and, and he ties into the, to how do you get strong in the Spirit then? The disciplines of a Christian the reading of God's word, the participating of worship in the gathering together of believers. That's what he says. 
coming together, connecting as, as a life-giving body, reading God's word and being, being nurtured like, like a dry, thirsty mouth, meeting an ice cold glass of water and worshiping. How are those in your life? Those are the things that empower you, that grow the spirit in you to be mighty, a mighty servant for him. Be controlled by the spirit. Colossians 2, 9 to 10, I think that's my last slide, says, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the story and life of Samson. We have to kind of rush through some of it, but we can draw some really good things out of it. I pray that in this chaotic world that we can learn from the life of Samson, see his failures, see his weaknesses, and many of us probably identify with some of those weaknesses. We too lack self-discipline. We too have lust. We, too, have problems with authority. We want to be our own authority. We want to do what's right in our own eyes, trust our own judgment. I pray that we would be a community of people that fully trust you, that, that trust your word, that trust the people you put into place because our hearts are guided by sinful desires and the world pulls us away from you, pulls us away from, from our, uh, your community to be involved in things that have no long-term or lasting merit. God, may we just give ourselves to you wholly. May we build into our lives those disciplines that we talked about, being filled with the Spirit and knowing, as he wrote in Colossians there, the, full, the fullness of, of all the deity was in Christ and it's in us. And we lift this up in Christ's name, amen. Let's stand and finish as we worship together. faith. God is so sovereign over the good and over the bad. Let's sing together, sovereign over us. There is strength within the sorrow. There's beauty in our tears And you meet us in our mourning With a love that casts out fears You are working in our waiting Sanctifying us when beyond our understanding you're teaching us to trust your plans are still to prosper you have not forgotten us you're with us in the fire and the flood you are faithful forever perfect in you are wisdom unimagined Who could understand your ways Reigning high above the heavens Reaching down in endless grace. You're the lifter of the lowly. Compassionate and kind. You surround and you uphold me. And your promises are my delight. For evil, 
You turn it for our good. You turn it for our good and for your glory. Even in the valley, you are faithful. You're working for our good. You're working for our good and for your glory. Even when the enemy means for evil, you turn it for our good. You turn it for our good and for your glory. Valley, you are faithful. You're working for our good. You're working for our good. For your glory, your plans are still to prosper. They have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the flood. You are faithful forever. Perfect in love, you are so. Faithful forever, perfect in mind, you are sovereign over us. All right, I just wanted to say thank you for coming and worshiping. Every week we're sending a letter out to let you know what's going to happen on Sunday. We uh, anticipate going to one service at some point, but we're really watching when we, we move into PCOR 3 for that, and we're going to try to make changes at the same time. We'll probably have our first Sunday with a few of the kids' classes on the Sunday we go to one service. So every week you can look for that letter to come out. We're just so blessed to have you here worshiping with us, and I hope to see you back next week so we can glorify God and see which shirt Mel and I will be wearing. <laughs> so God bless you. We'll see you next week, if not before. <laughs>